These guys can help you. Are you talking about amendments? Yes. Yeah, these two here. Please be upstanding for the President of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly.
down as soon as you like. I'm sorry, they've got me to me. There you are. Order, order. I now declare open the 64th annual session of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. Before we start, I invite Boris Vzesnevsky, the head of the Canadian delegation, to introduce Elder Malin Companion, who will perform the indigenous blessing. I'll start again. Elder Companion, President Yuknevichine, members of the Diplomatic Corps, distinguished parliamentarians, ladies and gentlemen, Kwe Jigalasi. Hello and welcome in Mi'kmaq. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathering in Mi'kmaq the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Nous reconnaissons que le peuple Mi'kmaq a été et continue d'être le gardien de ce territoire. As chair of the Canadian delegation to the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, it's my great honour to invite Elder Marlene Companion to offer words of welcome and a blessing. Kwe. I hope that you've all had a wonderful stay in the wonderful territory of Mi'kmaq. I'm very honored and very humbled to be here to do this prayer for you. Traditionally, we would ask people to stand. I'm not that traditional. So those people who wish to stand for the blessing may do so. Great Spirit, we give thanks that you speak to us in our own cultural ways. We are blessed to practice our traditions and that you also speak to us the culture and the traditions of others. Bless us that we may follow our teachings of our ancestors. May we walk, speak, and live with the seven sacred teachings, wisdom, truth, humility, love, honesty, bravery, and respect. Bless us so we may pass these teachings to our children and our grandchildren. Bless us to have the wisdom to protect Mother Earth and all living beings that walk upon her. We give thanks for all that she provides for us to, to sustain our lives. Bless us so that we may protect our air as each new being brought into this world depends upon it to live. Bless us that we may protect our water. Without it, our children may not drink. Bless our elders and our children, our families and friends who need your help. Bless those who are sick that they may be healed. Bless those who have passed recently with special prayers for those they left behind. Bless our brothers and sisters from the four races of humankind, white, yellow, red, and black, who stand shoulder to shoulder to pr protect all living beings that walk this earth. We pray that you protect them 
in their service to our territories. Bless us that we may continue to come to you with clean hands, open hearts, so that when life fades as a fading sunset, our spirit may come to you without shame. Great Spirit, we pray together with open minds, open hearts, with much respect to you on this day. All my relations, amen. Thank you. Thank you for the blessing. Minister Sajan, Speaker Jeffery, Madam Deputy Secretary General, dear colleagues, it is an honor and privilege for me to address you today as President of the Assembly. Over the past two months, I have done my best to represent you and support the Assembly's priorities. At the top of my list was the transatlantic relationship. On my first day as president, I went to Brussels to meet with the NATO Deputy Secretary General and other NATO officials. And I also met the US Ambassador to stress the Assembly's essential role in keeping the transatlantic bond strong. Just before coming to Halifax, I traveled to Washington to meet our American delegation, as well as officials at the State Department and the Pentagon. All of them reaffirmed the United States' firm commitment to NATO, to Article 5, and to Euro European security. The clearest demonstration of this commitment is the presence of US forces as part of NATO's enhanced forward presence, and the 4.7 billion US dollars committed to the European Deterrence Initiative in 2018, and 6.5 billion in 2019. All of those I met in Washington recognized that real progress has been made towards fairer burden sharing within NATO. However, as our assembly has also stated, more needs to be done. Why? Because we face an unprecedented set of challenges which concerns us all. Therefore, the 2% target is first and foremost a priority for each country to protect its own people. Of course, as allies and members of NATO, we must also each contribute our fair share. We cannot afford gaps of weak links in our defense. First, we face the resurgence of traditional state power. Russia had long made clear its ambitions, but since 2014, they have become plain for everyone to see. Russia is expanding its military presence and flexing its capabilities to convince others that no major international issue can be resolved without Russia. It is creating chaos and division wherever it can to maximize its own influence. And it is using every opportunity to test our unity and resolve to defend the rules-based international system. Russia's violation of the INF Treaty is only the latest example of this strategy. It is a way for Russia to test the United States' reaction and to test the strength of allied unity on a fundamental pillar of strategic stability. I personally welcome the United States and allies' firm response, and I am convinced that our approach 
to arms control must take into account developments in other parts of the world, particularly China. Russia is also using hybrid tactics and disinformation to undermine our democratic institutions from within. Many of the countries represented in this room have suffered such hybrid and disinformation attacks. Lies became a weapons of mass deceptions. As a result, the role of parliaments as guardians of our democ democracies has become even more important. In other words, parliaments and elections are the new front lines of our security. And the NATO Parliamentary Assembly has a key role to play in helping strengthen uh, the res resilience of our democratic institutions. This is why I chose to lead our Assembly's election observation missions in Bosnia and Herzegovina and Georgia last month. We will likely see more and more sophisticated attempts to interfere with elections. We must be prepared. Of course, we face many other challenges as well. In a globalized world, our security is directly affected by instability outside our borders. And unfortunately, in many countries across North Africa and the Middle East, instability has created a favorable environment for terrorists and traffickers of all kinds. At the same time, ongoing wars have caused humanitarian disasters of massive proportions and led millions to seek refugee elsewhere. Allies have sought to help address some of the causes of instability. Our countries are supporting the global coalition against Daesh, helping train Afghan, Iraqi, Jordanian, and Tunisian forces, and cooperating with the European Union in managing refugee flows. And we have seen some encouraging developments. Daesh has been effectively defeated in Iraq and Syria, and Your Excellency Deputy Speaker Al Haddad, Iraq is experiencing positive political, economic, and security momentum. Afghanistan continues to face serious challenges in all these spheres, but it was able to hold its first parliamentary election in eight years. We must remain committed to assisting our partners in these regions because, again, what happens there affects us as well. This is all the more true of our direct neighborhood in Eastern and Southeastern Europe. We must finally get rid of the remaining gray zones in Europe and implement the vision of a Europe whole, free, and at peace. This project has been my priority as president of our assembly. During my visit to Montenegro, all of the country's highest officials stressed the immediate and direct benefits which have resulted from NATO membership. At the same time, Montenegro is taking on its fair share of the burden for our shared security. It will span 2% GDP of defense by 2024. And in addition to its contribution to the Resolute Support Mission in Afghanistan, it has agreed to send personnel as part of KF4 in Kosovo and of NATO's enhanced forward presence in Latvia and Poland. Montenegro's membership in NATO serves a positive model for the region. Speaker Jaffery, I sincerely hope that your country will be the next to join NATO as a full member. National procedures are ongoing in both countries, and it is, of course, for them to decide. But I would like to salute the political courage that authorities in Athens and Skopje have already shown in addressing the sensitive name issue. The Western Balkans region is at decisive crossroads. Uh, positive momentum is essential for the other countries of the region who also aspire to join NATO or the EU, Bosnia and Herzegovina, as well as Serbia and Kosovo. Our Europe whole, free, and at peace must also include Eastern Europe. 
During my meetings with leaders in Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova, I have stressed the need to carry on with essential reforms, first and foremost for themselves, for their own country, and their own people. At the same time, it is important to remember where these countries come from, to understand the legacy of communist past they suffered, and to understand the challenges they face today. Both Georgia and Ukraine are countries under occupation. I grew up in an occupied country, and I know what this means. This is also why I accepted Ukrainian President Poroshenko's invitation to travel to eastern Ukraine. I wanted to thank the Ukrainian soldiers fighting there, that we understand that they are defending our freedom as well. Today, Georgia and Ukraine have made clear that they see their future as part of our Euro-Atlantic and European family. It is my strong belief that we must make a firm political commitment to ensure their transformation into fully-fledged members of our community. We have all the resources and experience needed to do this. I am also convinced that the success of these countries would send a strong signal to the people of Russia that for them as well, European future is a feasible option. This should be part of our common long-term strategy for Russia. We need to think beyond President Putin's Russia, beyond the current period of tensions, to the relationship we want with Russia in 20 or 30 years. Some of you will be surprised to hear me say this, but I am convinced that Russian people can live in democracy. However, for this, we must engage with the Russian people, not with the regime, and we must show them the benefits of democracy. Dear colleagues, next year, NATO will celebrate its 70th anniversary. The summit of NATO heads of state and government held in Brussels in July has set a clear path to ensure that NATO is fit for purpose for the challenges of today and tomorrow. Many of these measures require us, parliamentarians, to give our governments the means to implement these decisions. Over the past two months, I have witnessed the important role that parliamentary diplomacy can play. I am confident that the next president, who we will elect this afternoon, will continue to make our voice heard at NATO and in our relations with our many partners. Growing, in, growing up in occupied Lithuania, I would never have imagined that I would one day become the president of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. For me, as the granddaughter of the victim of the Stalin Gulag, it was an honor and a privilege to be able to serve in this capacity. Thank you again for your confidence. My special thanks to David, Ruxandra, Andrus, and all our brilliant secretariat of NATO Parliamentary Assembly. And thank you for your attention. It's now my pleasure to welcome the Honorable Hajit Singh Sajjan, Minister of National Defense of Canada. Anyone who would like to ask the Minister of National Defense a question after his address should let me know as soon as possible now. Please raise your hand 
so that staff from the Secretariat can identify uh, you and pass your names on to me. There will be a two-minute time limit for all questions, and I cannot guarantee that everyone who submits their name will be called because Mr. Sajan has to leave promptly at 10 a.m. Mr. Sajan, you now have the floor. Uh, first of all, I like to acknowledge um, that that uh, acknowledge that we are in the unceded ter ter territory of the Mi'kmaq peoples, and I want to thank the elder for her blessing. Madam President, Secretary General, Deputy Secretary General of NATO, parliamentarians from respective countries, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you at the 64th annual session of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. As you know, um, I just came back from, I was here in Halifax yesterday, but I came back from Vancouver. And those of you who may not know the time and space of that, it, I can probably get to Europe, uh, some countries in Europe faster than it is to Vancouver. So it's great to be back here. And this is how much I, uh, uh, the importance I consider of this, uh, uh, of this assembly. So the past few days, leaders from militaries, NGOs, media outlets, universities, and governments around the world have joined together in our beautiful city of Halifax for the Halifax International Security Forum. Together, we have reflected upon the most pressing security and defense matters around the globe today. Many of you have been part of those discussions, and I know they have been richer as a result because you have contributed your experiences and your perspectives. And on behalf of the Government of Canada, I want to thank you for your engagement. Now, having just wrapped up the forum, to, now is the perfect time to gather here to speak about Canada's contribution to NATO and our commitment to work with you, our allies and partners in the Alliance. Today, I want to reiterate Canada's firm commitment to NATO and speak briefly about the Alliance and our place within it. Everyone here today serves different countries, but at the end of the day, NATO brings us together for a common purpose. Our combined forces have made the world a safer place for our families and for our communities. It is because of each of us and the strong relationships that we have built that NATO is the example for what cooperation can achieve. Now, Canada has always been committed to that cooperation. As a matter of fact, Canada was one of the founding members of NATO. We have participated virtually in every NATO operation since its founding in 67 years ago. In Germany, during the Cold War, Canada was there. In the Balkans, in the mid-90s, Canada was there. In Kosovo, 1999, Canada was there. During the air campaign in Libya in 2010, Canada was there. Near the turn of the century in Afghanistan, we made a commitment that resulted in the deployment of more than 40,000 troops and the loss and the sacrifice of 159 of our military members. Canada was, without a doubt, there. Today, our commitment to the Alliance remains steadfast as ever. If there is anything that we have learned from discussions over the last few days at the Halifax International Security Forum and here, it is this. The cooperation that our countries maintain in NATO is needed more now than perhaps ever before. Whether responding to Russia's aggression, aggressive behavior in Eastern Europe, or to the growing instability in places around the world, we face even more complex and evolving threats on multiple fronts. Hybrid threats from in traditional and non-state actors, as well as from individuals. Borders being threatened and cyber attacks for which borders are meaningless. No single nation can face these challenges alone. So we come together in this extraordinary alliance to face them together. 
And earlier this month, in fact, our nations joined together in exercise Trident Juncture, NATO's largest exercise in its, since the Second World War. I know that when it comes to the importance of the NATO alliance, we all agree. Each of you understands the significant benefits of working together, which is why your nations are members. Over a year and a half ago, Kenda launched its defense policy, which is called Strong, Secure, and Engaged. And that policy identifies Canada's defense priorities for the next 20 years. It provides the Canadian Armed Forces with the direction, and more importantly, the predictable and sustainable funding they need to plan for the long term. As a guiding document, Strong, Secure, and Engaged reflects the evolving balance of power in the world. A world of increasing uncertainty, which more state and non-state actors are capable of exercising influence. It highlights the modern reality of conflict, from exploring new methods of warfare to emphasizing the need to address the root causes of violence and radicalization. It explores the changing nature of peace operations around the globe, with soldiers often being deployed into active conflict zones and given multifaceted missions to accomplish. Strong, secure, and engaged follows the most comprehensive consultation in Canadian defence history. During the development of that policy, Canadians were clear. They want Canada to remain engaged in the world. And our government delivered a policy that met that demand. We have re-emphasized Canada's commitment to international partnerships with NORAD, the United Nations, and of course, with NATO. Now today, Canada is very proud of the leadership role that we are taking with NATO. We are leading a multinational battle group in Latvia as part of NATO's enhanced forward presence in the Baltic regions, with seven nations participating. As part of that commitment, we have 450 members of the task force, along with a range of vehicles and equipment deploying and training together with Albania, the Czech Republic, Italy, Spain, Slovakia, and Slovenia. And as Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced this summer at NATO's Leader Summit, we will extend our mandate for this mission for four more years until 2023. On the high seas, Canada has been deploying a frigate on a persistent basis in support of the NATO Maritime Command since 2014. In the air, Canada has provided people and equipment to the NATO air policing missions in Romania, Lithuania, and Iceland. Ukraine is another country where Canada is proud to demonstrate our unwavering political, economic, and military support for the cause of peace. We have trained over 10,000 Ukrainian service members to date, and we've been staunch in our support for the people of Ukraine and their territorial integrity. While not specifically part of a NATO mission, Canada's work in the Ukraine contributes to stability in a region of great importance to the Alliance. In the fight against Daesh, Canada has contributed significantly to the coalition's efforts in Iraq and evolved our support with our role to medical uh, facility, tactical airlift, to air-to-air -air refueling, and our efforts to support the coalition in the areas of intelligence operations. We have deployed intelligence gathering experts, delivered over 60 million pounds of fuel to coalition aircraft, and our special forces have led tra training to the Iraqi security forces on the ground. Our leadership in NATO is also evident by our decision to command the NATO mission in Iraq. As part of this new mission, our contribution also includes advisors, trainers, headquarters staff, and force protection. And this past summer, Prime Minister Trudeau also announced that Canada will assume command of a new training and capacity uh, mission in Iraq uh, uh, for at least one year. And our government announced that it would provide $26.7 million to improve women and girls' livelihoods in Iraq and Syria. We firmly believe that gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls are essential to building real and lasting peace in Iraq and Syria. We are also directing our resources to help the Alliance advancing its women in peace and security agenda. We know that good intelligence is essential to all successful military operations. 
That is why Canada is proud to take over the chairmanship of NATO's Military Intelligence Committee this year. By continuing to work with, alliance, with, with allies to provide first-class intelligence to the alliance, we are critically enabling NATO leaders to make informed decisions on all operations at all times. We also know how important surveillance and reconnaissance are to these missions. And that is why we were so pleased to have Canada rejoin NATO's Airborne Warning and Control System Program, known as AWACS, and to provide up to 25 personnel within the next five years to, to participate in that important initiative. These commitments are not without cost, and that is why our defense policy is fully costed and fully funded to ensure that we can deliver on our commitments. Through strong security and engage, Canada has increased its defense spending from $19. billion and will reach up to $13.7 billion per year, and that's an increase of more than 20, sorry, more than 70 percent over the next 10 years. After a decade of declining defense spending, our government made increasing defense spending a priority. In a press conference before the uh, uh, NATO Defense Ministerial last month, the NATO Secretary General Jens Stolenberg specifically noted Canada's progress in defense investments. He stated that last year the European allies and Canada boosted their defense budgets by combined 5.2%, noting that it was the biggest increase in real terms in over a quarter of a century. And Canada is also making significant investments in the modern capability that NATO needs in today's security environment. In fact, we will be spending a full 32% of our defense budget on those capabilities by 2024. And we have, uh, we have a track record of making our forces and our equipment available to NATO. And most notably, within those investments, we have committed to purchasing 80 new, 88 new future fighter aircraft to replace our existing fleet. And this commitment will ensure that we can simultaneously meet both our NORAD and NATO commitments. Now, the launch of the future fighter procurement process brings us closer to meeting these commitments. But while we launched that process to replace our current fleet of fighters, we have also announced the purchase of Australian fighter jets to supplement our current air capabilities in an interim fashion because we have missions to fly. These decisions will enable the fighter fleet to meet its operational mandate while we continue to focus on the future fighter procurement process and as we engage with industry. Our investments are not solely focused on our air capabilities, of course. We are also investing significantly in the naval capabilities so that we strengthen our maritime surveillance and posture. Most importantly, we have also made significant investments into the care and the well-being of our military personnel and their families. As many of you have heard, heard us say during uh, at HISIF, our people are our greatest priority. There's nothing more important than extending the best programs and services to support their health and also to their families. Just as it, as it is critical to give our personnel the best tools to do their important work, it is equally important to ensure they feel supported while doing it. So ladies and gentlemen, before I close, I want to focus on the relevance of NATO in the world. As Canada's Foreign, Minister, uh, Foreign Affairs Minister, Christian Freeland, recently noted how many papers she had, written, uh, she had seen written asking whether NATO remained relevant in the 21st century. Now, everybody in this room knows the answer to that question. Now, if we were to ask the people of Latvia whether they thought NATO remained relevant, if we were to ask the people of Romania whether they thought NATO was still needed, and certainly if we asked the Iraqi people whether NATO was still doing critical work around the world, the answer would be a resounding yes. NATO's critical role in maintaining peace and security in the world is appreciated by its citizens because threats still remain. And ladies and gentlemen, Canada has always been proud of our membership in the Alliance, and we are proud to work with all of you. Merci beaucoup. Uh, we now come to questions. I will follow our usual uh, proceedings. I will announce those called to ask questions. 
in groups we have just one up to now uh, and uh, Ms. Cheryl Gallant, Canada. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to the Minister for attending our conference and uh, sharing Canada's plans uh, for the future of our military and, and as it applies to NATO. Uh, during your remarks, you made reference to the 18 additional used jets that uh, Canada is acquiring. Given that that's an additional capacity for Canada, can NATO count on those jets if and when needed in NATO operations? A uh, really good question, uh, Cheryl. I'm happy to be answering that. In fact, actually, I just vi uh, last week visited our air, t air task force in Romania, where our, uh, our fighters have been actually intercepting uh, Russian aircraft, and a lot of lessons have been learned. Uh, from there, so uh, we have been consistently, we have actually added the air policing um, as part of our, our commitment. We've done it in Iceland, in Lithuania. And in fact, at that time, we actually had um, an additional, uh, I believe we had another 10 fighter jets as part of Trident Juncture as well. So it, yes, it is absolutely very important to make sure that we have the, the right capabilities to provide not only jets for operational needs, but also for training needs while we at the same time meet our uh, uh, North American defense needs as well. So absolutely. Thank you. Lord Campbell, UK. Uh, uh, I hope you'll forgive me pressing you on the matter of uh, aircraft. Uh, um, I, I, I think I'm correct in understanding that at one stage Canada had the view that acquiring of the F-35 would be an appropriate way in which to keep the Air Force fighter capacity up to date. Uh, are you able to say why it was that Canada decided not to proceed with that particular acquisition, particularly given the fact that, of course, that a number of NATO countries have done this, have agreed to adopt that aircraft, and of course, the whole question of interoperability always arises on these occasions. I'd be very grateful for your observations. Sir, who asked that question? I don't put up your hand, please. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm just trying to see where it came from. Uh, no, it's a very good question. Um, for us, every nation needs to make sure that they uh, uh, acquire the appropriate equipment, not just only for their needs, but the commitments that they have made. And for us, uh, what we ended up, what we did was to, uh, we, we stated that we were not going to sole source the F-35. We were going to launch a competition to making sure that it meets the requirements that we have uh, set out. And those requirements includes uh, not only our, uh, our need, uh, our NORAD missions, but our also our NATO missions. And as you know right now, how many aircraft NATO actually uses uh, f uh, for their missions. And in Afgan Afghanistan, um, uh, we see a number of aircraft that, that were flying. So now, we will uh, go through an appropriate process and a, uh, and a selection will be made. For us, when we're spending billions of dollars and making sure that we can actually live up to our commitments, it was important for us to go through a proper uh, procurement cycle, an open and transparent competition, so that we actually pick the right aircraft. And, and a number of companies have, are, uh, have already st stepped forward and will go through that process and want to make sure that it's done independently based on the requirements that have been selected. But also to add your note how seriously we take this. When we actually did the analysis during the defense policy review of saying how many aircraft should we select, and if you recall, the number at that time was 65 the, of, of the sole source of the F-35. And obviously my question was, okay, how did we come up with that number? And I didn't get the appropriate answer of, of, of for that, uh, of why 65 was. But at the end of the day, we have to look at what commitments um, has our nation made um, to, to our alliances. So we have our NORAD commitment is very important to us and obviously our NATO commitments. And we have said publicly on many occasions that currently we cannot meet our NORAD and NATO commitments simultaneously. So what we have done as a government and in our defense policy, made it a policy now as a government that, we, that the military must need, meet its NORAD and NATO commitments simultaneously. And obviously we'll need some time to actually reach to that, that level. 
Hence the reason why we have decided to not only launch that, uh, the, the open and transparent competition, that we're actually purchasing additional jets from Australia so that we can uh, actually uh, not only meet, uh, eventually meet our needs, but be able to fill that gap as well. Evans Klementievs from Latvia, by the way. Yesterday, Latvia celebrated centenary, their statehood centenary. Congratulations. Evans, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. President. First of all, I would like to say thank you very much for the hosting this assembly. It's a great job what you did, and you did the job very excellent. Thank you also for your visit in Latvia to have the meeting with uh, international battalion, especially with the Canadian soldier who stay in Latvia. Thank you very much for this support, and we hope we will be working much more years. But the question is my, uh, how you see what the NATO Parliament Assembly and what the NATO should do, just our organization will be more stronger. Maybe we don't use the, all our possibility, because yesterday in Science and Technology Committee, we talked about the scientific, just we, as a parliament, need to support more scientific and to put the money in the scientific, because the scientific, the space, always go together. In this money, what we put today, after a few, a few years, will be returned back. How you see the situation? Thank you very much. No, uh, thank you very much for the question, and congratulations on your uh, anniversary. Uh, it's always a privilege to go back to, uh, to Latvia, uh, and I've been there a num number of times. Uh, one of the most important things that all of you can do uh, and, and at, at the end of the day, we're all in this to, to, uh, together, is first of all, when we talk about deploying our truth-making decisions, whether it's in Latvia, um, or sending our ships into the Black Sea, the Mediterranean, air policing, we are sending a message of defense and deterrence. We're sending a message of interoperability. So it is important for us, all of you in this room, to express that. Our troops give action to our words and our troops actions allows us to go on the stage and talk about interoperability and what the, what they can do so that's also equally important the other aspect one that's very important and, uh, and the secretary general uh, stresses on this is we need to talk about cash we need to talk about how it invests into capabilities and we need to know how it turns into contributions all three things are necessary and capabilities are not just about the ships, and exactly what you mentioned. We need to make sure that we stay at the cutting edge of technology. Are we investing in the right research and development? And uh, just to let you from, uh, from Canada's uh, perspective, in our defense policy, we have put aside $1.6 billion for defense research and development for the next 20 years to making sure not, that the new capabilities that we develop are going to stay at the cutting edge. And that's what's going to keep NATO relevant and also uh, uh, making sure that we have a very strong and defense deterrence message that we can send any adversary. Thank you, Minister, for reaffirming Canada's strong contributions to NATO and uh, to European security. I would like to thank you in particular for Canada's leadership role in NATO's enhanced forward presence and your strong bilateral assistance to Ukraine. Uh, your address makes clear that Europe has two very close friends and allies on this side of the Atlantic. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much. It was a privilege. It is my pleasure to welcome Rose Goethe Muller, Deputy Secretary uh, General of NATO, thank you for your attending today and for the excellent meeting we had in September. Anyone who would like to ask the Deputy Secretary General a question after her address should let me know as soon as possible, please, as well as before, raise your hand so that staff from the Secretariat can identify you and pass your names on to me. 
There will be a two-minute time limit for all questions, I just remind you. And I cannot guarantee that everyone who submits their name will be called. Thank you, thank you for understanding and Dieros, floor is yours. Hmm? Okay, so you will get. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, truly a pleasure to be here in snowy Halifax in this beautiful facility. I've really been enjoying my stay in Canada despite uh, the winter weather, or maybe because of the winter weather. It's uh, very nice to, uh, to experience. And thank you very much, Rasa. Uh, um, it is a real pleasure to be with you today here. I really did enjoy our conversation when you visited my office in September, and uh, thank you for the intensive work you've undertaken over these months of your presidency. Really appreciate that very much. You know, for over 60 years, the NATO Parliamentary Assembly has provided an essential link between the NATO headquarters in Brussels and the people our alliance exists to protect. The first duty of any government is the security of its citizens. As elected representatives, you play a central role in holding your governments to account, holding their feet to the fire when it comes to the money they spend and the actions they take, actions which, when it comes to security, often center on the NATO alliance. You also act as our promoters in chief with your public fostering public understanding and support for our alliance. And to me, that is one of the most important functions of national legislatures, national parliaments, to form connective tissue for us at NATO headquarters and for all the troops who serve NATO with your public. So I thank you very much for that role. In the age of active disinformation campaigns, this is more important than ever, and so I know we all have to be alert to, uh, to the, the burgeoning of disinformation campaigns, but I thank you again very much for helping the publics to understand what is fact and what is disinformation. This month, in ceremonies around the world, we have been remembering the fallen from the First World War and all wars and conflicts since then. I myself was in Brussels to mark the armistice last week at a ceremony led by the King of Belgium to honor those who had made the ultimate sacrifice. Those men and women came not just from Europe, but from all over the world. Thousands of American and Canadian soldiers found their final resting place in Flanders Fields, a place immortalized by the Canadian poet John McRae. We honored them at the armistice ceremonies. What touched me most about that ceremony in Brussels, however, was the children involved, children of all ages, from the scouts, from the guides, from the military schools in Belgium. Some spoke beautifully, truly beautifully, about remembrance. It is important that the young are learning how to remember. And I really took that away as the, the main lesson of that ceremony, that the young of Belgium are learning to remember. Sadly, the Great War was not the war to all, end all wars 100 years ago. Little more than two decades later, the lure of nationalism and hatred led us to another devastating global conflict in which million, millions more lost their lives. In the years after World War II, our leaders sought a new way, a better way of conducting international relations. They came together to reshape our world with multilateral institutions, such as the United Nations and also NATO, institutions that unified our nations in the pursuit of peace. Human nature may mean there will always be disagreement, but that doesn't mean we must accept that war is inevitable. Unity among allies has underpinned our security since NATO's beginning. For nearly seven decades, the United States, Canada, and Europe have depended on each other. A stronger, safer, more prosperous Europe means a stronger, safer, and more prosperous North America. Of course, in some ways, the bonds that unite us are under strain. There are significant differences of opinion over issues of trade, climate change, and the Iran nuclear deal. These disagreements will not vanish overnight, and there may be others to come as well. 
but differences of view, of view are normal among friends and allies. I always think of NATO as one big family, and families often have disputes, but it doesn't mean that the family dissipates or disappears. We have had our share of disagreements in NATO across its 70-year history. The Suez Crisis in the 1950s put a great strain on the alliance. France actually left the command structure in the 1960s, meaning that we moved from Paris to Brussels. And more recently, there was the Iraq War in 2003. Despite all these differences, despite all these strains, however, when it came to the crunch, when it came to our commitment to stand together, protect each other, we remain united. It is clearly in our interest for Europe and North America to stand together today. That is why young Canadians and American soldiers fought in the Western Front in World War I, and why so many of their sons later fought their way across the beaches of Normandy. And it is why hundreds of thousands of European troops fought side by side with their North American brothers and sisters in Afghanistan following the attacks on 9-11. We saw this unity of action once again last month in the biggest NATO exercise since the end of the Cold War. The minister already f referred to it in his remarks a few moments ago. Trident Juncture brought together 50,000 troops from all 29 NATO allies, plus Finland and Sweden, brought them all to Norway. Nearly half of them came from across the Atlantic. As I saw for myself, it was a huge logistical undertaking and a real test of our military mobility and interoperability. It was a test, in my view, that we passed. Still got more work to do, but clearly the Alliance passed the test. Let me give you one example of that inter interoperability. I, I really love it. German tanks arrived in Norway on a Danish vessel. They were checked by Norwegian specialists fueled by a Belgian fuel truck, and loaded on Dutch and Polish transporters by road and rail, and taken to their final destination. All of which was supervised by an American movement control team and overseen by Bulgarian logisticians. Now that, to me, is interoperability and cooperation across the alliance. Really a terrific example. When I was there I, uh, at Trident Juncture, I spoke to a French CBRN team. They told me about what we would need to do if we were to come into contact with chemical, biological, or radiological weapons. The protection, the mitigation, the cleanup, all of these steps were things that they had well in hand. Now that we have seen chemical weapons being used in Syria, sadly, and in the UK, it was good to know that NATO teams are practicing what would need to happen if our troops encountered such threats. I also spoke with the Modular Combined Petroleum Unit, part of the refueling team. This unit is uh, where the rubber really hits the road in terms of interoperability. They were telling me about the different sized hoses they need for different vehicles, quite extensive as you can imagine and the challenges of having to deal with both the metric system and for one ally who shall remain nameless, the imperial system. But they were up to the job. They had what they needed and they were taking care of all the differences in order to ensure interoperability. It was really impressive. I really got a lot out of being there for the Distinguished Visitors Day. So I want to pay tribute right now to all the capable men and women who work so hard to move all the forces and equipment in and around Norway for Trident Juncture. They made the exercise a success. Trident Juncture demonstrated the increasing capabilities of our armed forces. Defense budgets across the Alliance have risen every year for the past four years. Together, European nations and Canada have been responsible for an additional $87 billion for defense spending since 2014. Despite all the evident debates in the media, I am very much heartened by renewed efforts to strengthen European defense. It, if properly implemented, improvements and ex uh, expansion in European defense spending can benefit Europe as well as NATO overall. Uh, such expenditures can mean greater European defense spending and stronger European capabilities, and they can contribute to better transatlantic burden sharing. I want to repeat that again. European expenditures on defense, there's no reason why they cannot contribute to better burden sharing inside of NATO. 
A stronger Europe means a stronger NATO, but it is important that all of this remain within the framework of the transatlantic alliance. Our exercise tried to juncture also sent a very clear message to all who may think to challenge the alliance. NATO stands ready to defend all of the allies against any threat. This is an important message as we deal with a more challenging and complex security environment. International terrorism, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, and of course, an increasingly aggressive Russia. Russia has illegally annexed Crimea. It continues to actively destabilize Eastern Ukraine, where more than 10,000 people have lost their lives since 2014. Russia has used a military-grade nerve agent on the streets of the United Kingdom. They initiate a constant barrage of cyber attacks, and they interfere in our elections and in our domestic affairs. In addition, they have also undergone a vast expansion and modernization of their military. One particularly worrying aspect of this is the re rearmament effort is their new uh, intermediate range missile, the 9M729, or in NATO parlance, the SSC-8, which is capable of carrying a nuclear warhead to the heart of Europe in minutes. This directly undermines one of the most important arms control treaties of the Cold War, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, or INF. When it was signed by Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev in 1987, it not only reduced the number of nuclear missiles held by both superpowers, it eliminated an entire class of weapons. The INF Treaty made Europe and the world a much safer place. Allies first raised concerns that Russia might be in violation of the INF Treaty in 2013. At the time, Russia categorically denied developing a new missile. Now they have finally admitted that it does exist. And this new weapon system has placed the INF Treaty at serious risk. If a treaty is only respected by one party, it cannot effectively keep us safe. As this issue is debated, I ask you to remember one thing. There are no new U.S. missiles in Europe of intermediate range, but there are new Russian missiles in Europe of intermediate range capable of carrying nuclear warheads. NATO has repeatedly urged Russia to address our concerns and to ensure it is in full compliance of the INF Treaty. Nobody in this room wants a new arms race or a Cold War. Now is the time for dialogue, but it is also time for action by Russia to allay our very serious concerns. It is vital that when NATO talks, we do so with one voice and from a position of strength. Our NATO summit in July was a strong affirmation of an alliance that delivers. It delivers in achieving fairer burden sharing. It delivers in stepping up the fight against terrorism. It delivers in strengthening our deterrence and defense, reaching out to partner countries and organizations and it delivers in keeping our doors open to new members. But the work continues. At our meeting of foreign ministers in December, we will discuss a whole range of important subjects. We will discuss transatlantic security, including burden sharing, and the challenge posed by Russia, including the threat to the INF Treaty. We will meet with our partners in the Resolute Support Mission on Afghanistan, and we will also discuss the strategic threat coming from instability in North Africa and the Middle East. We will discuss NATO's new Canadian-led training mission in Iraq, and here I want to express my sincere appreciation for Canada again stepping forward to take over the command of this important new NATO mission. Also, the implications to our mission of the recent elections there. And we will discuss what NATO can do to strengthen the Libyan state. Another focus of the ministerial will be the Western Balkans. A lot is happening in the Western Balkans at this moment. Progress on the name agreement between Skopje and Athens opens the way toward NATO membership. But there are continuing tensions elsewhere in the region and we see increasing levels of Russian interference. We have had relative stability and calm in the Western Balkans for almost 20 years now. It is important to NATO and for European security that that continues. Ladies and gentlemen, next year we will celebrate the 70th anniversary of the signing in 1949 of the Washington Treaty, NATO's founding document. We will also mark the enlargement of our alliance by over a dozen countries of Central Europe, 
in 1999, in 2004, and in 2009. These anniversaries will be an opportunity to cement in the eyes of our public the urgent need for the NATO alliance, not as a Cold War relic, not as something that's outdated, but as an anchor of stability and an essential tool for the security of all of our nations. In this, we will need your full support, your support with NATO, for NATO within your parliaments, within budget discussions, and with your publics will make a big difference. There is nothing stronger than this alliance when it is united and when our publics are behind it. In that, your support is essential. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I do look forward to our question and answer period. I'm going to uh, sit down so I can more easily take note of the questions asked me, and I'll do the best I can to answer your questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Rose, uh, for your remarks. And now we come to questions. Please be seated. Uh, Philippe Folio, France. Or maybe we will group into, into three questions, OK? So next will be Julia Miranda Calia from Portugal. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Madame la Secrétaire Générale, je vous remercie de vous être déplacée à l'IFAX pour répondre aux questions des parlementaires de l'Assemblée parlementaire de l'OTAN à l'occasion de cette session que nos amis canadiens ont remarquablement organisée et nous les remercions. Ma question au nom de l'ensemble de la délégation française porte sur le Sahel, ce vaste espace relativement peu peuplé pour le moment, mais dont le dynamisme démographique est impressionnant. Cette zone géographique traverse depuis plusieurs années les épreuves d'un terrorisme qui mêle l'idéologie islamique et divers trafics, notamment la drogue et les trafics d'êtres humains. Le groupe spécial Méditerranée-Moyen-Orient de l'Assemblée parlementaire de l'OTAN, que j'ai du reste l'honneur de présider, s'est penché depuis longtemps sur cette question. Nous l'avions évoqué dès 2007, alors que le phénomène n'était qu'embryonnaire. Il est devenu depuis cette date un véritable problème de sécurité qui a conduit la création de la force du G5 Sahel et celle de l'Alliance Sahel, à savoir une action sécuritaire couplée à un programme de développement qui bénéficie de l'aide de l'Union européenne et de plusieurs États membres de l'Union européenne, comme l'Italie, l'Espagne, l'Allemagne, le Royaume-Uni, le Danemark, le Luxembourg, les Pays-Bas, la Finlande et la France. Madame la secrétaire générale, je souhaiterais savoir d'une part si l'Alliance atlantique considère le Sahel comme un élément primordial de sa sécurité et d'autre part comment elle compte analyser l'action qui est conduite par la force du G5 Sahel. Enfin, vous semble-t-il possible que l'Alliance atlantique apporte si nécessaire une expertise supplémentaire et des moyens à l'action militaire en cours actuellement Thanks. Uh, Julia Miranda Calia from Portugal. And the next will be Lord Jopling from UK. UK. Thank you very much, President. Uh, dear uh, Deputy Secretary General, it was a very good uh, exposition you made to us, and I'm grateful for that uh, uh, presentation. My question is, the hub for the South was declared fully uh, operational at the Brussels summit. Is the EB fully uh, resources now, or are there still any shortfalls that NATO allies should fill? This is my question. And I profit this opportunity to make a reference to our um, president of the assembly, uh, Mrs. Raza Yuknevichian. She was a great president. She is a great uh, uh, reference in our assembly. And uh, I am very honored to have her presidency. Thank you, uh, Raza, to be with us. Thank you for your work and merit and fair play. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Uh, 
Lord Jopling, UK. Um, Deputy Secretary General, uh, you are aware, I know, that uh, the International Board of Auditors for NATO have made serious reservations about the way NATO controls its financial affairs. I have twice asked the Secretary General to comment on those reservations, and twice I have had no answer whatsoever from him in a way which I can only describe as dismissive. I can only assume that either he didn't know or he didn't care about uh, these important reservations. Uh, and both of those would be and are unacceptable. But by contrast, you kindly have sent me in the last few days a four-page letter uh, answering those reservations. And I want to take this opportunity warmly to thank you uh, for the response uh, which you have made. Now, if I may turn to what is the classic role of parliamentarians in uh, checking the executive and asking questions and demanding answers, perhaps I can ask you a question following your letter. Can I take it that NATO intends to pursue the establishment of genuinely independent audit committees at the level of governing bodies compliant with international standards and best practices on governance. Uh, that is, if I can put it briefly, the big committees not only made up of nations' representatives, but also including recognized professional independent experts. Can I have a simple yes to that, if you please? Rose, floor is yours. Thank you very much. I will take the, uh, the questions in, uh, in order. Um, thank you very much uh, for all of the questions. Very thoughtful, as I've come to discover in this body, uh, and extremely well informed. Uh, first of all, to our uh, French colleague, uh, indeed, uh, NATO has been watching with, uh, with close interest uh, what is going on in uh, the Sahel region. Uh, it is, uh, I think, worth pointing out that uh, there is, uh, I would say, a focus in NATO on working with our um, Mediterranean dialogue partners in uh, the North African part uh, of uh, the Mediterranean, but here uh, our uh, Mauritanian uh, partner in uh, the uh, Mediterranean dialogue, NATO's body, um, have asked us to look at uh, what is going on with the G5 Sahel and consider being engaged uh, there uh, as well as uh, the G5 Sahel, uh, France itself, uh, and uh, other countries who have been operating in the context of the, of the G5 Sahel. So um, it is a, a request we have seen. Um, I do want to underscore an important point, though, and that is that uh, NATO cannot and does not do everything when it comes to instability in this part of the world or any place else. I always, and here I'll make reference to the cooperation with the European Union, who has very much been focused on, uh, on strengthening border controls, on uh, developing uh, the, at least the kernel of economic assistance and uh, cooperative programs to develop the potential for more economic health and prosperity, developing in the region to begin to address uh, the major problems that, that ignite the problems that can then come to dog Europe in terms of uncontrolled migration and uh, issues of that kind, human smuggling. So I always like to say that there are several uh, toolkits out there. The European Union uh, has one toolkit, particularly focused, uh, again, uh, in part on uh, defense, on military activities, but also focused very much on, uh, on assistance, on uh, financial and development aid. NATO has a different toolkit. We don't do everything, and we won't do everything. So the question is, um, you know, can we effectively bring our toolkits together and uh, form a single 
a very effective toolbox? I like to think the answer is yet is yes to that question, and we are increasingly developing our cooperation with the European Union in order to be able to do that. Whether or not uh, we will come to uh, exercise uh, those uh, cooperative efforts uh, in the G5 Sahel region, I cannot uh, tell you, sir. It's always a decision for uh, NATO allies as a whole. It must be a uh, of course, a consensus decision for NATO to become more uh, more engaged in that region. But we will continue to work with our uh, Mediterranean dialogue partners in every way we can to facilitate an enhancement to security um, in that region of the world. Um, the po uh, Portuguese question with regard to the hub for the south, and indeed, uh, very, very glad to see it declared uh, fully operational at our NATO summit in July. Frankly, we do uh, continue to experience uh, shortfalls in terms of manning. We are looking particularly uh, to focus on uh, developing more uh, civilian expertise at the hub to back up the military expertise, very capable military expertise already existing there. But, but the hub, uh, the idea of the hub is to really help NATO have more over the horizon uh, capability to uh, to uh, see threats before they come at us. And so for that, we need not only very capable military expertise, but also civilian experts. So uh, that is what, what we are focusing on now. But the hub is getting off to a very good start, and we've been very, very pleased to have that, uh, that new uh, capability uh, and new, uh, new potential developing. Uh, Lord Joplin, thank you very much. I will say, and I do want to emphasize, uh, as I should have said earlier today, that the Secretary General very much values his, his interactions with, with this body. Uh, he was very sorry he could not be here uh, to meet with you today. I just mentioned the EU. The EU foreign ministerial is going on in these days, and so he is, uh, he is present at the ministerial. But he asked me to convey his very best wishes to you. And I want to say, sir, that I was responding on behalf of the Secretary General as his deputy. Of course, uh, I don't do anything unless it's uh, at his request and in response uh, to, uh, to the concerns that have been raised in general by you, both with him and with me over time. So uh, I cannot give you a simple yes or no to your um, uh, question because uh, I don't know enough about exactly uh, what uh, we are doing in-house on this issue. Again, I will take the question and get you an answer. I uh, can confirm that. I will say, and I wanted to point out that uh, we are working hard to implement NATO fi financial regulations across the body now in our agencies as well as in uh, the NATO institution per se. And I hope, uh, Sir uh, Lord Joplin, it will give you uh, some uh, positive feeling that uh, whereas in the past we have had less than half of our audits come in, uh, you know, without questions being asked this year, the the uh, number of audits that have come in without question being asked, uh, it's at 70 percent. So we are improving, and we will do everything we can to continue to do so. But I will take your question, sir, and get you an answer. Thank you, Ricardo Arno, Spain, and the next will be colleague from Norway, Christian, Spain, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I will speak in Spanish. In primer lugar, dar las gracias, señora Gotemeller, por su presencia en, en esta asamblea y a la delegación canadiense por su eh, trabajo y hacernos sentir a todos en casa, aunque, aunque con un poco de frío. Durante estos días en Halifax he podido comprobar que para algunos miembros de esta Asamblea la política común de seguridad y defensa de la Unión Europea supone una amenaza para la OTAN o la entienden ellos como una amenaza para la OTAN. En cambio, para nosotros no se trata de competir, sino de coordinar una política europea de defensa. Hay problemas que debemos resolver solos e incluso nuestros aliados nos piden que lo resolvamos solos. 
Como ejemplo, pongo las intervenciones en el Sahel. Usted mismo acaba de contestar al representante de la delegación francesa pues, eh, eh, que hay cosas que la OTAN no puede llegar a todos los sitios. Ignorar que en el norte de África hay una grave crisis migratoria, económica, eh, donde la presencia de fuerzas eh, terroristas amenazan eh, al territorio de la Alianza Atlántica sería un grave error. Señora Gochenmoller, eh, ¿considera que el modelo europeo de integración y colaboración de las políticas nacionales de defensa supone algún tipo de amenaza para la OTAN, como así plantean algunos parlamentarios en esta Asamblea? ¿Considera usted que el fortalecimiento industrial, tecnológico y presupuestario en materia de defensa de los países de la Unión Europea no, no solo no es una amenaza, sino que mejorará notablemente las capacidades de la OTAN y que es beneficioso para todos los aliados? Muchas gracias. Uh, Christian Tibring Giede, Norway, and the next speaker will be from Iceland, Daniel Friedbergson. Christian, Thank you very much, uh, and, uh, Ms. and uh, Madam uh, Deputy Secretary. We will share the question between uh, the two of us here in the Norwegian delegation. I just wanted to uh, to thank uh, all NATO allies for uh, participating in the. Uh, Joint juncture exercise uh, in Norway, the recent exercise, and uh, the exercise shows that uh, the alliance uh, stand together. It was a great uh, opportunity to uh, show cooperability and uh, show that uh, uh, we are building a teamwork and it's a solidarity between the, the alliance. So Norway thanks uh, thank all the members uh, for that. My a very short question before I leave the floor to my colleague here. It's just about the recent uh, uh, accident we had with the uh, Norwegian frigate. I guess uh, you all heard of it. And I just wonder, uh, uh, we, we lost one of, our, one of five frigates that we have. And I just wonder what NATO, uh, how NATO is involved in this, uh, uh, in, not in the investigation, but how they are in contact with the Norwegian government in order to maybe uh, look at the accident. Thank you. And then leave Sina. Nial, floor is yours. Iceland. One more question. We have a question from Norway here to my colleague. That's why we share the two minutes. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is about the relevance of NATO's Article 5 to so called hybrid warfare, understood as warfare using non military unconventional means in addition to the conventional ones. In Ukraine, during the past four years, one has seen massive cyber attacks, for instance, against the country's electoral power system and the emergence of paramilitary groups. If such attacks were to be directed against a NATO member country, where would the alliance, in your view, draw the line for triggering Article 5? And if you, I may, uh, could you also comment upon the northern sea route along Russia's northern coast that will likely to be open for year-round passage within the next uh, 20 years? Uh, what, in your view, will this imply for NATO and the alliance member countries? As we know, that China and uh, Russia now has an ongoing uh, maritime cooperation, and that will be, of course, a very short route uh, when this uh, sea route will open. Thank you very much. Iceland, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Mrs. Deputy Secretary General. We are all aware that the High North is becoming increasingly important in its uh, strategic, security, and economic dimensions. Arctic ice levels are decreasing rapidly, and such changes are affecting traditional ways of life. Also, there are growing opportunities for commercial shipping, resource extraction, tourism, and fishing. However, as the commercial importance of the region grows, and uh, with geopolitical changes in the region, there are fears of increasing tensions between the countries with littoral Arctic waters. Furthermore, Russia has put increased focus on militarization of the region. In the light of these recent uh, geopolitical developments, as well as the fact that five members of the alliance have territory in the region, do you see NATO's role in the high north increasing and will its attention on the security aspects become greater? Thank you. Thank you uh, very much for those uh, excellent questions. Some of them uh, can be grouped together talking about uh, what's going on in, in the high north. I will say a big thank you uh, to Norway 
for hosting Trident Juncture. It was a massive, massive effort. And again, seeing I was in prom time and recognizing, you know, how much uh, the local publics were welcoming uh, the the exercise units, despite the fact that it was. Uh, a lot of traffic on the roads uh, and a lot of, of presence uh, there, but nevertheless, I do know that uh, the Norwegian public was extremely, extremely welcoming, so we're very, very grateful for that. Um, we are, of course, uh, aware of the, uh, of the recent accident uh, involving the Norwegian frigate. Of course, my boss, Sekjen Stoltenberg from Norway, very, very aware, obviously, and, and expressing his, uh, his concern about it, but uh, we're all very glad that, uh, that the accident occurred and did not result in, in loss of life. Uh, that was uh, really quite an amazing, I think, rescue effort uh, in, uh, in the wake of, of the accident. It will be, of course, uh, up to Norway to uh, carry out the investigation. NATO is not directly involved uh, in the investigation, but we are interested, of course, in, in knowing what the results of the investigation are. Um, let me uh, take the other questions that are related to uh, the north and the northern sea route uh, together at, the, at this moment. Of course, there are indeed uh, greater opportunities for economic uh, activity at, in the far north as the, uh, as the ice melts, and uh, clearly we can see that there is great interest uh, not only in in Russia um, developing the Northern Sea Route for commercial purposes. It can, uh, of course, uh, be, of, and it will be of great benefit for global commerce if that sea route can be developed in a, in a safe uh, and effective manner. And, and indeed, China is very interested as a, as a global commerce uh, giant. China is very interested in, in uh, cheaper ways to ship goods uh, from Asia to the other parts of the globe. So all of this is very understandable. But uh, I think from a NATO perspective, what concerns us is greater militarization in the far north. And we have seen the Russian Federation modernizing its uh, military facilities in the high north, much more present uh, with, uh, with ships, uh, submarines. And it's meant for NATO that we have truly had to, again, uh, intensify our attention to uh, very important areas of uh, military activity like anti-submarine warfare. And I want to give credit to uh, Iceland here for being very engaged and involved in our ASW training and exercises recently. The Dynamic Mongoose exercise last year was a very good example of how the Alliance is again turning its attention to ASW and emphasizing uh, again both the training and the exercises but also thinking about the new capabilities that will be required. And here I'd like to give a, a shout out to our Canadian hosts in their investments, putting a lot of, uh, of investment into ice-capable ships. Uh, just in recent days, an ice-capable patrol ship, the DeWolf was launched, very, very good, and in icebreakers as well. So it, all of this means for NATO, talking about the NATO alliance, all of this means that we have to pay attention to training, to exercises. That's why I think it was great we had Trident Juncture up in the high north. It was a, it was a wake-up call for some allies who aren't used to exercising and training. In, uh, in very cold winter conditions. So we need to be doing more of that. We need to be focusing on the particular challenges that uh, will come as there's greater submarine activity and, and greater uh, maritime and naval activity overall by the Russian Federation in the high north. So a lot of work to be done. I feel good that uh, we've had that wake up call. We're focusing on what's, uh, what's needed. We're looking at uh, ways to intensify training in the high north, uh, but also looking at ways to acquire the capabilities we need. But here again, and one final point that I think is important, because the members of the alliance uh, who uh, are focused uh, in polar regions, have are bordering on, on the polar regions, are also members of the NATO Council. I'm sorry, of the Arctic Council. Here again, NATO doesn't do everything. The Arctic Council focuses very much on important efforts such as um, emergency response, search and rescue, all of these non-military arenas that are very important also for ensuring that the polar regions remain an area for cooperation and not for confrontation. So NATO's not involved 
in the Arctic Council. It won't be involved in the Arctic Council, but uh, the two organizations have, uh, have different roles, but nevertheless, both are very, very important. And from NATO's perspective, of course, what we want to see is uh, a peaceful Arctic where uh, trade and economic activities can, can develop uh, in a peaceful and cooperative way. Now, um, on to the question about uh, the, the uh, influence or the relevance of Article 5 to hybrid measures uh, and cyber measures. This is an area where the Alliance has uh, paid a lot of attention in recent years. At the Warsaw Summit uh, in 2016, for the first time, NATO declared that um, cyber attacks are relevant to Article 5. In other words, a, uh, an ally can invoke Article 5 in response to a cyber attack. It's the same at our summit this summer in Brussels with regard to hybrid uh, measures. And hybrid and cyber, sometimes you know, people talk about them uh, together. But I, th I think it's worth noting that, that hybrid is, is a larger category, that it can include uh, everything from disinformation, uh, attacks uh, using all kinds of methods and platforms to uh, the notion of little green men, uh, irregular forces attacking a country. So it's, it's very, very important, I think, to bear in mind that the Alliance is uh, looking at this uh, set of threats in association with Article 5 and stating clearly that for uh, potential adversaries, they should have a wake-up call that indeed if they go after NATO countries with these kinds of, uh, these kinds of attacks, indeed uh, they are risking Article 5 being invoked. But there are two important points about this. First, it's a deterrence measure. Having that kind of declaratory doctrine is an important deterrence measure in my view. But the second thing is then we have work to do inside the alliance to ensure that we are ready to respond if, if uh, that um, that invocation occurs. And, and that means we have to think carefully through what the range of responses might be. It's not necessary, or not necessarily so, that the alliance would respond to a cyber attack with a cyber response. That's a possibility. We have been agreeing about cyber effects being made available uh, by certain of our allies in that uh, eventuality. But it's also very important to think about other uh, response measures that, that may be taken across the spectrum of tools that are available to, to NATO. So we have to think those uh, steps through carefully. And then we also have to think about uh, measures of resilience among all the allies and helping the allies to develop resilience against such attacks. And furthermore, then, to be able to identify such attacks and, most importantly, to identify who perpetrated such attacks. Oftentimes, uh, it is said in NATO uh, circles, and of course I agree with this, that it's a national responsibility in the end to do the forensics, to do the identification. We agree with that, of course, at NATO headquarters, but that does not mean that NATO cannot help all allies uh, to understand uh, the complexities of forensics and to understand what, uh, what their responsibilities are in that, uh, in that regard. So there are a lot of very, very complicated issues here, but I am very confident coming out of Warsaw and Brussels, the two summit meetings over the last uh, two years, that in fact we are thinking very, very hard about how to confront these steps, uh, these kinds of threats. and. Uh, and indeed uh, thinking through uh, our responsibility to be able to respond to uh, a threat of, uh, of attack in a number of different ways, including and up to the invocation of Article 5. Thank you. Now, next three questions in group. Uh, first one, Greece, and Andreas Loverdos. The second one, Lithuania, Jose Solikas. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam uh, President. Uh, my remarks concern NATO's orientations. As my country is situated in the southeastern Europe, in, in the Balkans, we Greeks uh, can easily uh, realize what exactly the Russian threats are. However, I share the opinion that our alliance gives less importance to the threats coming from the South. 
first of all, terrorism, drugs, migrants smuggling, have been mentioned many times in the recent joint declaration of um, you, um, Europe and NATO. But actually, as a matter of fact, as alliance, we are underestimating the gravity of these threats, the gravity of these dangers for all our countries. I believe we must do more to this direction. And I am asking from you, Madam Deputy Secretary General, for your comments. Thank you very much. Joseph Olekas, Lithuania, and next, uh, Belgium, uh, Brigitte Grevels. Joseph, floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the uh, Deputy General Secretary for a very informative, impressive, and interesting statement. Uh, I strongly agree and uh, believe uh, that you said uh, that our strength and power is in the political unity and military interoperability. Uh, especially in this very challenging time, and we mentioned hybrid cyber or threats, terrorists, and Russia activities. Uh, my question is about uh, our partners, relation with our partners. Uh, in our committee meetings, we discussed in, in this assembly also about um, the Georgia, Ukraine, and we welcoming uh, Georgia engagement in strategic discussion and mutual effortness on Black Sea security, Georgia contribution to NATO efforts to enhance Black Sea security. We also support and, uh, many countries from allies the training of uh, Ukraine military forces. And we know about the goal of Ukraine to reach uh, NATO standards in 2020. And keeping all that in mind and keeping in mind uh, our uh, open door policy, and also that uh, a lot of efforts uh, Ukraine and Georgia uh, doing to, for, to reach the, the standards. And also what uh, our president of assembly said that Ukrainians, they soldiers fight not only for them freedom, but also for our values. But we as alliance and uh, our parliament assembly can do more than this our door open policy and uh, Ukraine and Georgia uh, activities have reached a success. Thank you. Belgium, Brigitte, floor is yours. Thank you, Mrs. Deputy General, Secretary General. Thank you for your introduction. Thank you also to the Canadian delegation for an excellent organization and reception. Thank also to Raza, being an excellent, warm-hearted president. Mr. Deputy Secretary General, the worst threats from hybrid tactics coming from Russia is probably influencing the hearts and minds of our own population through clever propaganda, fake news, lies, with the aim to break the transatlantic unity of NATO to break Canada and the United States away from solidarity with Europe. Telling that NATO commitments cost too much, financing certain opinion makers or other things could lower support of our population to NATO. Is this at this moment considered as a realistic threat and what is the answer of NATO to this? Thank you. Thank you um, very much um, to our uh, Greek colleague for his uh, question. Actually, this is a, another fine example, I think. First of all, NATO is uh, very committed in our framework for the South. I've talked already today about the hub for the South and what we have done to bring it to full operational capability and, and the additional resources, uh, especially in terms of civilian expertise we're looking for there. 
but the framework for the South has been a very important mechanism to focus the attention of the Allies overall on what we need to do working together with our partners in the region. Again, I mentioned the Mediterranean partners, but in addition, the so-called Istanbul Initiative partners who are the, the Gulf states, they will help us, I think, to, um, to increasingly focus our attention uh, in uh, that southern region that is so critical to the security of, of Europe overall because precisely of the, the problems you point to, the drug smuggling, the human smuggling, the flow of, of migrants fleeing from uh, violence, war, and economic, uh, economic problems, poverty, uh, lack of water, uh, all of the problems that are emerging uh, in, uh, in those regions, of, across those regions of the world. So um, what we have really been focused on doing up to this point uh, have been what I like to think about as really bread and butter efforts or, or very pragmatic efforts to make a difference. Here I refer to the operations that we have had in the Eastern Aegean working together with the Greek and the Turkish Coast Guards uh, in order to help uh, to, uh, to stem the flow of migrants in that area, but to make sure that those who are uh, you know, adrift in, in the sea are not uh, abandoned uh, to the elements and, and uh, are, are left to perish. So helping, helping those who are, uh, who are in those circumstances to, to uh, survive the experience. It's also the case in the central Mediterranean, working together with the EU, once again, our Operation Sea Guardian and uh, the European Operation uh, Sophia, having the two to work uh, together to help to stem the flow of migration and make sure that, again, that it is uh, taking place in as regulated a manner as possible. So we have been trying to be as pragmatic as possible. The other area where we have really placed a focus in working with our partners, uh, and here I'll cite the work we've been doing in Jordan and, and Tunisia overall, is work on uh, defense institution building and defense capacity building. So once again, NATO's particular role is to help uh, the armed forces, the security forces in those countries to perform in a responsible way under proper oversight of uh, civilian government uh, leadership. And so uh, we have a particular role to play once again in, in providing for that kind of defense institution and capacity building, and we will continue to do so. But again, in pragmatic ways, we are trying to help with particular problems that have come up for these countries. In some cases, for example, they are facing a great deal of unexploded ordnance uh, from uh, civil conflict that has been occurring in those areas. So we are trying to help train and help, uh, help develop capacity in those countries so that they can, they can clean up some of those vestiges, those horrible vestiges of, of civil conflict that have occurred. So we are doing everything we can across a broad front, I have to say once again, and I want to underscore once again that uh, NATO does not do everything. We have a certain, a certain toolkit that we work with, and we must, I think, continue really to develop our cooperation with the European Union so that we are complementing each other, so we are getting the best possible value out of the out of the tools that we have available and ensuring that what really needs to happen, that is the provision of economic development, the provision of you know, more stability so that uh, economic development can occur, jobs can be created, and that we can keep the populations really uh, prospering where they are and not, uh, not uh, being forced into migratory patterns. These are, I think, strategic goals, not only for NATO, but for uh, the European Union and for the individual countries who are working in that region as well. Certainly the United Nations, who is also very active uh, in, uh, in uh, Northern Africa, very, very much share those goals. And by the way, the Secretary General just signed, uh, together with uh, Secretary General Guterres, uh, an updated uh, joint declaration about a month ago that is enhancing our cooperation with the European Union, I'm sorry, with the United Nations. And uh, a lot of that cooperative work will have uh, to do with, uh, with uh, focusing on the South and being effective in working together with the United Nations on t tackling some of these problems. So uh, we will continue to do the best we can with uh, what resources we have available. 
Our partner relations uh, with uh, Georgia and Ukraine, very important. In uh, a couple of weeks' time, we will be gathering together at our foreign ministerial meeting again uh, with the foreign ministers of Georgia and uh, Ukraine. Uh, that, I think, will be an important moment once again to underscore the message that we conveyed at the July summit meeting in Brussels. That is that the Bucharest summit declaration of 10 years ago, from NATO's perspective, very much in force still, and uh, that Ukraine and Georgia very much uh, on the track to NATO membership. Both countries have more work to do. They need to continue to pursue the path of reform. And I don't want to group them together because they are at very, very different places in, uh, their, uh, in their development and in their reform processes. Georgia has made tremendous progress and is working very closely together with, uh, with NATO, uh, for example, through the so-called JTEC, the uh, Joint Training Center in Tbilisi, that is helping very much on uh, things like uh, training and exercises and actually contributing in a very, very proactive and responsible way to, uh, to developing exercise planning. So uh, I would say Georgia's in um, uh, a different place uh, compared with Ukraine, who have been fighting, sadly, been fighting an active war on their territory and have had to put quite a bit of attention into the capacity and capability of their armed forces. But nevertheless, we continue to encourage the Ukrainian government to proceed forward with the implementation of their national security law. Uh, and uh, we'll continue to work with them very closely on the path of reforms as well. But, um, but I did want to underscore that uh, NATO's door very much remains open, talking about our work with Skopje, as I did in my, in my address a few moments ago. Uh, the NATO accession process uh, is very much entrained there with NATO accession negotiations ongoing. We expect them to conclude in early 2019. Uh, again, the caveat is there that uh, the two countries, uh, both Athens and Skopje, must work together. And we, as I understand, we'll continue to work together. Skopje has uh, some work to do in their parliaments, in their parliament, in order to ensure that the constitutional changes are made that will allow the Prespia agreement to uh, come uh, into full force. So, uh, with those caveats, I did want to underscore that NATO's door uh, is open. Uh, the Belgian question on uh, hybrid tactics. Uh, I want to talk about how. In fact, NATO is learning to respond very effectively to hybrid tactics. It's incumbent on all of us to recognize what is happening uh, with the corrosive effects of disinformation in our countries, in our societies, but it is quite possible to push back and to push back effectively on these disinformation techniques. NATO does so from headquarters. We work very hard to make sure that we are getting out the facts about what NATO does and not uh, in any way to descend to the level of these propaganda claims, but to get, get the facts out and make it clear uh, that what we are doing uh, is supported uh, by facts and information. We do so in a transparent manner. I just uh, talked to a big group of Russian experts who were at uh, NATO headquarters last week. Uh, many of them are pretty uh, influential in Russia in terms of uh, talking, being talking heads in their media. But it's very important to be transparent about what NATO is doing. We had Russian uh, media people come to Trident Juncture to see on the ground what we're doing. So get the facts out. Don't be afraid about reaching out to, uh, to the Russian media to get the facts out directly to them. But the other thing is we need to be proactive about pushing back. I was just uh, talking yesterday when uh, I was, uh, was talking to the Canadian media here in town about the way Latvia has been so effective in responding to disinformation uh, regarding the, uh, the presence of the uh, battle group on, uh, on Latvian territory and responding to the various uh, attempts to portray you know, the misbehavior of Canadian troops, Canada, of course, being the lead nation for that battle group, um, and how Latvia has very effectively uh, pushed back against that. And Lithuania has done an excellent job as well in that regard. So I think we all need to be aware of what's going on, to recognize the disinformation, to be armed with facts, to push back and uh, to be transparent, but to push back, push back in an active way. And the media has a role here as well. 
It's very, very important, and Sekjen Stoltenberg always emphasizes this to media uh, counterparts saying, get to the bottom of this. You know, when you see something that doesn't look quite right, ask questions. Don't just accept it on face value. So the media has a responsibility as well in dealing with, uh, with this kind of disinformation. But I am by no means hopeless about uh, addressing these kinds of hybrid tactics in the disinformation sphere. Uh, and I want to finally give a shout out to our center of excellence in uh, Riga, Latvia. They, the Stratcom Center of Excellence has been doing some excellent work in terms of showing the way in pushing back against these kinds of techniques. Thank you. Uh, next three, Canada, Jane Cordy, Germany, Jürgen Hart, and the uh, European Parliament will be the next. Canada, Jane, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you, Madam President, and welcome to Halifax, Madam Deputy Secretary General. Yesterday at our Civil Dimensions of Security Committee, we had an excellent panel and an excellent discussion on women, peace, and security. And it reaffirmed that while we've made some progress, we've still got a long way to go. And discussions about the integration and inclusiveness of women in the peace and security agenda seem to have been going on for a long, long time. Um, so in the uh, 2017 annual report of the Secretary General, and I'll quote from it, NATO invests in incorporating gender perspectives into the analysis, planning, execution, assessment, and evaluation of NATO-led military missions, and continues to deploy trained gender advisors to operations and missions at strategic, operational, and tactical levels. So going forward, I guess my question is, in what other ways does NATO plan to fulfill its objectives with regard to women, peace, and security? And secondly, uh, do we have ways to measure the success of what programs are already in place and new uh, recently put in place uh, initiatives that NATO has brought in? So how are we determining whether or not they are successful? Thank you. Jürgen, Germany. Jürgen Hart aus Deutschland. Ich würde gerne auf Deutsch sprechen. Frau stellvertretende Generalsekretärin, herzlichen Dank für Ihre klaren, präzisen Worte. Das schätzen und kennen wir hier in der NATO-PV, dass wir mit präzisen Informationen versorgt werden. Und dafür sind Sie uns alle bekannt und dafür schätzen wir Sie. Ich möchte ausdrücklich auch aus deutscher Sicht betonen, dass ich voll hinter Ihren Worten zum Thema Burden-Sharing stehe. Wir werden in dieser Woche im Deutschen Bundestag einen Verteidigungshaushalt für das Jahr 2019 verabschieden, der gegenüber 2018 eine Steigerung um 12,2 Prozent vorsieht. Ich glaube, das ist auch im NATO-Vergleich als Steigerungsrate im oberen, in der oberen Spitze. Und damit will Deutschland auch ein klares Signal setzen, dass wir die Beschlüsse von Wales von 2014 ernst nehmen. Meine Frage richtet sich an Ihre Ausführungen zum Thema INF-Vertrag. Die Parlamentarische Versammlung und zur Beratung hier haben gezeigt, dass wir uns bei der Analyse, dass Russland gegen den Vertrag verstößt, sehr einig sind. Und dass wir uns da auch darüber einig sind, dass wir Russland verantwortlich halten müssen im Blick auf diesen Vertrag. Ich finde es gut, dass Sie gesagt haben, die Aktion zum Thema Durchsetzung des INF-Vertrags muss in der NATO abgestimmt sein. Ich glaube, das ist ja auch ein wichtiger Tagesordnungspunkt auf dem Außenministertreffen Anfang Dezember. Ich glaube aber, und da würde ich gerne Ihre Meinung zu hören, dass die einseitige und nicht mit den NATO-Partnern abgestimmte Ankündigung des amerikanischen Präsidenten, den INF-Vertrag nun amerikanischerseits zu kündigen, strategisch kein kluger Schritt ist, weil er geradezu eine Einladung an die russische Seite ist, eben sich nicht an den Vertrag zu halten, nicht nachzuweisen, dass sie sich daran halten und das, was möglicherweise schon stattgefunden hat, einfach offiziell und ohne ähm, einen bestehenden Vertrag zu machen. Wir würden durch eine solche einseitige Kündigung keinen strategischen Vorteil erringen. Und ich äh, wollte Ihre Meinung dazu hören, weil ich glaube, dass die NATO-Partner dies gegenüber dem amerikanischen Präsidenten so klar machen sollten. European Parliament, David uh, McAllister. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, President, uh, Deputy Secretary General. I would like to comment on the cooperation between NATO and the European Union you were just talking about a few minutes ago. As we speak, 
uh, the NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, the EU's High Representative Federico Mogherini and the EU Foreign Ministers are sitting together in Brussels to forge even closer ties between our organizations. And I guess we all agree that since the Warsaw Declaration and the adoption of the global strategy, strategy in the European Union, cooperation between NATO and the EU has become more intense during the past two years. We have definitely made progress. However, I still believe that we could work even closer together, even more intensively in the future, because as we have heard this morning, complex threats need common answers. So the question is, Deputy Secretary General, the NATO summit in July took stock also of EU-NATO cooperation and issued a new joint declaration. What progress can you see in the cooperation between the two organizations since this summit in Brussels? And in your assessment, what are the benefits of this cooperation and where do you see further room for improvement? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, some very good questions once again. Um, I think I've um, joked to this body before. I always feel like I'm in front of a supercharged uh, committee hearing in the U.S. Senate or the U.S. Congress. So, uh, But thank you for uh, all the variety of questions and the great interest that uh, you give in supporting the work, the work of NATO. First of all, on women, peace, and security, I'm very glad that you had a chance to speak with Claire Hutchinson yesterday. I thank Canada for uh, putting forward uh, Claire for the position of the Secretary General, Special Representative on Women, Peace, and, and uh, Security. She is a fantastic ally in this effort and a very effective bureaucratic player within NATO as well, which is very important. She's very effective in the corridors of NATO. Um, you know, we have a long history of putting forward um, gender advisors for K4, gender advisors in Afghanistan. I think that history speaks for itself, but what Claire has done and what I have been very keen to ensure that we do is uh, to refresh our policy in a way that will carry it effectively into the future. That is why I was so pleased that at the July summit meeting uh, we were able to, uh, to uh, uh, agree to a uh, new, not new, but a, 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 a refresh of our, uh, of our policy with regard to women's, uh, women, peace, and security, and also agree to an action plan, uh, a refreshed action plan going forward. And this has lent new impetus uh, for all of our nations, but also our, our partners, the allies themselves, but also the partners have really been sitting up and taking notice on the WPS issues in recent time. I thank all of those countries around the room who have put a special emphasis on this matter. Uh, in addition to Canada, uh, Iceland, Norway, the UK, um, I'm probably missing somebody, forgive me, the US is another, but, uh, but I do want to say that it's good to have uh, a number of allies pushing very, very hard on these issues. Oh, the Netherlands is another, uh, another very good example. So we have some friends in this effort and we are continuing uh, to, to uh, push hard to be more effective in this regard. What I would like to see, frankly, is more of what uh, I again call these pragmatic projects. We just completed not very long ago the construction uh, of uh, so-called women's town in Afghanistan, uh, which will enable uh, women to train safely and with their families uh, present safely for service in the police forces in Afghanistan. And they could not have done that if they did not have a, a safe and secure environment to live with their families while this training is going on. They couldn't be thrown in together with male recruits in the same, in the same dormitory areas, in the same living space. That uh, perhaps can happen in our countries, but it cannot happen in a place like, like Afghanistan. So I was very, very glad that we were able to provide funding for this pr pragmatic uh, enablement 
of further training for women to serve in the police forces of uh, Afghanistan because it's, it's the women who are the ones who can go into the communities. They can get oftentimes to the heart of a matter uh, that involves uh, women victims where uh, a male would not be nearly so effective. So in order for security and stability to come to Afghanistan, we have to have uh, we have to have women involved and trained and ready to uh, work the issues and deal with the problems in the same way their male counterparts are so trained. So I think it's uh, very important. I would like to see more of those kinds of pragmatic projects going forward. How to measure success. I hope Claire talked about this somewhat yesterday, but this is one of her main goals for the next year because, Frank, quite honestly, we have not done enough in figuring out ways to adequately measure uh, our accomplishment and our shortfalls. So uh, Claire has got a, a big emphasis on this particular area uh, for 2019, and I welcome that very much. I will do whatever I can to support her in her efforts to develop be better measurement techniques so we can truly understand how effective we are being and help our allies also as they're implementing their own national plans to understand what, what effectiveness means in this regard. Uh, the uh, German question uh, with regard to uh, the INF Treaty, and thank you very much for your, your uh, kind words addressed to me. The INF Treaty um, is, uh, as I said in my remarks, uh, you know, something that has contributed to strategic stability here in Europe, and not only here in Europe, but on a global basis as well for for uh, now a number of decades, and it is a very important treaty. It is, however, um, a treaty that is, uh, is only as important as the implementation uh, of it occurring in a, uh, in a solid manner. And so I actually agree with SecDef Mattis, Secretary of Defense Mattis, when he came to the Defense Ministerial in October and said, it is untenable for only one uh, member, uh, one signatory of the treaty to be actually implementing the treaty. And uh, the other uh, significant uh, signatory violating the treaty. It's, it's untenable in that uh, regard. And as I said in my remarks, I think it's uh, not correct that only uh, Russia should have uh, ground-launched intermediate range missiles. Now, who knows what the NATO response will be in this case, but NATO will take steps uh, to uh, defend itself. We do not foresee deploying intermediate range nuclear missiles in Europe uh, that are ground launched. And indeed, uh, there is no need for that. As I see it, the US has uh, very good sea launched and air launched capabilities that do not in any way violate uh, the treaty. So the important thing is at this moment, I think, is to support the efforts to ensure, first of all, that Russia is taking this matter seriously. I was involved during the Obama administration in uh, attempts to get Russia to pay attention to this matter. We pushed them from 2013 on. They would never even acknowledge the missile, but we raised it frequently throughout my time in office, and then the Trump administration picked it up. So it's been a true bipartisan uh, effort, and we had a briefing team at NATO uh, a week before last, and they laid out the diplomatic history for, uh, for the entire NATO community, talking about the more than 30 meetings and diplomatic uh, discussions that have taken place on this matter between the Obama and the Trump administration over the past five years. So a true bipartisan and, uh, I would say, by administration effort, both administrations involved in trying to, uh, to make progress on, the, on this matter. But the Russians have simply stiff-armed us at every step of the way. And so now I think it is important that they be called to account. I do think it's important that we continue to focus on diplomatic efforts to call them to account. And that is definitely uh, the, the effort that the, the allies are undertaking now to make sure the Russians know this is serious and also to do everything that we can to encourage 
them to get down to business at the diplomatic table. So um, I think that's uh, that's the main the main point, and uh, it is I think very important to continue to work together and to pull in the same direction on this matter. And there's been very good cooperation. Not only the briefing teams that have come over from Washington, they've provided very very good information, uh, so that allies are more and more gathered around the notion that this is a very significant violation of the I. INF Treaty, but they've also, I think, uh, contributed uh, very well to the discussions among among the allies on this matter. So the foreign ministerial coming up in a few weeks' time will be an important step along the road, but I, for one, continue to uh, believe that it's possible for the Russians to come back into compliance with the treaty and to preserve this important treaty. Um, the question from the European Parliament about where we stand on uh, cooperation between NATO and the EU. Uh, we have indeed made progress. I agree with that, as I stated myself. Um, and the joint declaration, the new one that, uh, that the uh, Secretary General signed uh, with Presidents uh, Tusk and Juncker during the summer, right uh, before the summit uh, meeting took place, has been an important additional impetus. Uh, so, um, so what progress? Uh, I can see significant progress in uh, important areas that I think will carry us forward into more effective interaction. Right now, for example, there is a so-called parallel, parallel and coordinated exercise that the EU is sponsoring called PACE 2018, focusing on terrorist threats. Uh, this is uh, something that is uh, really important for NATO and the EU to be able increasingly to, to uh, understand each other's decision making, to understand uh, warning and how warning is treated in each case, to be ready to respond together in the case of terrorist attacks, for example. And this exercise is very much uh, focused on terrorist, uh, counter-terrorist uh, uh, actions. So I think that's a good example of how the fabric of the EU and the fabric of NATO are coming together uh, more closely on uh, issues such as uh, crisis response and crisis decision making. So I would like to see uh, more of that kind of uh, close and, uh, and difficult work going forward. <coughs> Excuse me. It's not easy to bring together the procedures and the, uh, the way of uh, making decisions in two very different organizations, but that's the kind of, of really deep cooperation that we need to be doing more of in my view. Thanks. And now three more questions. First from Armenia, Korean Nahapetian, Georgia, Sofia Katsarava, and Ukraine, Irina Friz. Armenia, please. Thank you, Madam Deputy Secretary General. As stated in Brussels Summit Declaration, NATO's partnerships will continue to be essential for the Alliance's work. In this regard, I have two interconnected questions. Many partner countries have individual partnership action plan and other toolkit of cooperation, particularly engagement in peacekeeping operations in different interoperability initiatives, and so on, under the auspices of NATO. Within the general policy of NATO, what does the essential nature of the cooperation entail? And secondly, uh, will it include new cooperation directions within partner nations in military and security domain? If so, what possible directions would you emphasize, including in frames of the security network with the European Union? Thank you. Sofia, Georgia. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Secretary General. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, interesting and informative introduction and answers. Uh, and on behalf of the Georgian delegation, I would like to uh, thank you for your personal engagement and support to Georgia's Euro-Atlantic integration. We highly value this. 
Um, I would also like to thank our colleague from Lithuania who in a way asked the question about uh, Georgia and Ukraine and I completely agree with you that the consistent messages about open door policy are extremely important for us. However, I would still try to, I would still like to uh, ask a specific question on Georgia, uh, particularly given that Georgia and NATO possess all the practical tools for preparations of Georgia for the membership and we meet all the criteria on defense spending capabilities and contribution to shared Euro-Atlantic security, and Georgia is recognized as an exemplary aspirant nation. Uh, there is still no consensus built amongst the allied nations. Uh, and here, this morning, I was reading, uh, literally a few minutes ago, I read uh, the statement by uh, the former Secretary General saying that uh, it was a, a mistake uh, from the side of NATO for not granting MAP to uh, Georgia and Ukraine, uh, and it was a bad signal to Putin. Um, so my question would be, considering all the above and the lessons learned from the recent past, what other concrete preconditions should be created to facilitate consensus building process uh, in the alliance? Thank you once again and taking the opportunity to thank our Canadian colleagues for hosting us so warmly uh, here. Thanks. Irina Fris, Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you, Madam Deputy Secretary General. At this se session, we discussed the issue of Russian private and military companies' activity. But I'd like to make a stress on the problems of the foreign mercenaries, those who fought in Syria as ISIS fighters and those who fought in Donbas. For example, hundreds of foreign fighters in the east of Ukraine. Some of them are specialized on sniper actions. We have all evidences of crimes, names, and place they came from. My question is, don't you think that we should pay more attention to the problem of mercenaries who participate in battles, have fighters experience, and could be used by hostile forces in our countries? Thank you. And um, first of all, I, I wanted to um, emphasize the degree to which I personally uh, support and uh, and I'm delighted to see the presence of partners here uh, also participating and obviously with a great deal of uh, of sophistication uh, helping to focus the attention of the broader uh, NATO community on some of the particular issues uh, and dangers that you face uh, in your country. I will just mention briefly my recent trip uh, to Georgia as well and having an opportunity to meet there with women who are trying to help to provide humanitarian assistance to the populations in South Ossetia and Abkhazia and uh, the heroic role that they are playing, but also help me to understand quite vividly some of the particular challenges for Georgia in dealing with that situation. And very, very uh, much the same endorse Irina Fritz and her role. The several times I've been to Kyiv recently, having an opportunity to meet with women there and to understand the challenges in the Eastern Donbass. So I thank you all uh, for uh, helping to open our eyes to what uh, the large challenges are of living in these areas where there are uh, continuing, continuing um, conflicts going on. And uh, turning now to Armenia, I had an excellent trip to Armenia uh, a few months ago, about six months ago. And uh, I want to underscore uh, the degree to which Armenia has uh, been a very good uh, partner uh, in the Caucasus region and has, uh, again, been uh, helpful to us in terms of understanding some of the particular challenges uh, in that part of the world. But you ask an interesting question about the essential nature of partner cooperation. What does it entail? And it's, uh, as you know very well, sir, it's a kind of uh, multi-speed cooperation. Partners determine for themselves 
what uh, speed they want the cooperation to be at and how intense they want it to be and what uh, particular uh, uh, aspects they want to focus on in choosing from the menu of activities, the training activities, the other kinds of cooperative activities that NATO has on offer. So the IPAPs are very much, uh, the individual partnership and cooperation plans are very much uh, focused, programs are very much focused on uh, what each partner wants to do, and, and NATO doesn't, doesn't force any partner to do anything, uh, but we look for what the particular interests are and what the particular needs are uh, for, uh, for particular uh, partner countries. And uh, in that regard, I think uh, Armenia has been very good at, at, uh, at developing a unique program that's suited to its uh, particular needs. And uh, I want to particularly endorse the way Armenia has worked together with uh, Germany and with NATO to fulfill its uh, responsibilities and commitments on, under the Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty. Uh, working to uh, eliminate some uh, vehicles that uh, needed to be eliminated under that important treaty. Armenia did not have the uh, resources available to do so, but Germany stepped forward, and in a very responsible way, Armenia uh, was then in that way able to fulfill its commitments under CFE. And it's so important because CFE is yet another of those treaties that the Russians have treated in a very fast and loose way in 2000 seven seizing implementation of CFE in a way that was very questionable from a legal standpoint. So uh, again, I, I endorse uh, the, the responsible approach that Armenia has taken toward that treaty. On Georgia, um, uh, yes indeed, uh, the um, Georgian um, uh, acquisition of all practical tools in terms of, uh, of being uh, being along the road to preparing for NATO uh, membership, uh, defense spending, it really, I agree, has been an exemplary uh, nation. Uh, and you asked the question of what uh, can best be done uh, to, uh, to work with the NATO allies on producing consensus. And I think my best answer to that is to do what you have been doing, and that is to consult very closely with NATO member states, to be constantly in contact with them, to be interacting with NATO member states, not only uh, as Georgia does, working together with us on our important missions in Afghanistan, working with us uh, to, as I mentioned, train, uh, to prepare exercises, to train for exercises. Georgia has been uh, of enormous importance to helping us develop cooperation in the Black Sea region and particularly cooperation on training and exercises in the Black Sea region increasingly becoming a focal point for, uh, for Russian uh, naval activities as well as air activities. So uh, that military interaction is very important to the development of consensus over time. But uh, also, it's very important to continue developing uh, consultation and deep and intense interaction at the political level as well in order to develop that consensus over time. So I endorse what George has been doing so far and say that, uh, that keep at it. I know it's hard uh, work, it's intense work, but nevertheless, I think Georgia is going about it in, in a, very, a very positive way. Um, the question, uh, the the uh, Ukrainian representative asked about the role of mercenaries and shouldn't we be focusing more on that? My answer is a definitive yes. I want to say that um, Ukraine and NATO have recently agreed on a so-called counter-hybrid platform to study uh, what has been going on in the eastern Donbass, what has been going on uh, with the hybrid techniques that uh, Russia has perpetrated uh, in Ukraine, on Ukrainian territory. And so I very much uh, think that this is a win-win situation for the alliance to be able to understand better uh, the sophisticated um, evolution of these hybrid techniques that Russia is perpetrating. And frankly, I think the use of um, 
of these mercenary uh, and uh, private military companies is, is an aspect of what we should be looking at uh, in uh, developing with Ukraine our agenda for the counter-hybrid platform. It's, it's going to be very, very important, I think, for us to understand more fully because we've watched what's going on in Ukraine. We've watched what's going on in, in Syria with, uh, like, the Wagner Group and so forth. But I have to say, in terms of understanding what the potential implications may be for NATO, I think that that uh, that discussion could be very, very useful. So again, thank you to Ukraine for providing us with the mechanism through the counter-hybrid platform. This was agreed not so very long ago. Now we have to develop what the agenda will be, and, and this is an important topic. Thank you. Next three, the USA, Gerald Connolly. Next, uh, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, uh, Vessel Memedi and UK Richard Benyon. Gerald, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Madam President and uh, Madam Deputy Secretary General. Thank you for being here and for your patience. Um, I wanted to return to the high north or the Arctic. Uh, this body actually addressed uh, security in the Arctic last year in a what some described as a brilliant paper. Um, I couldn't comment. But, but two things. It, it, just as you said, uh, NATO can't do everything. Neither can the Arctic Council. The Arctic Council does not provide collective security. Lots of other things, but not that. What we documented in that paper was the Russian military presence in the Arctic is expanding. Like during the Cold War. And we, NATO, need to respond. We need to at least be upping our monitoring. And we called for an annual report on the security situation in the Arctic so that if other decisions need to be made, they can be. Is that report forthcoming? And if not, why not? Vessel Memedi. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Deputy Secretary General, we are really sorry for bombarding you with so many questions, and I thank you for your patience. Uh, in your presentation, you talked about differences of opinion among member allies, and you illustrated with two examples with regard to Iran Treaty and the trade war. I would include two or three more with regard to reluctance of invoking Article 5 because of aggressive people of Montenegro, or unilateral decision on invading Iraq, and finally, unilateral decision on INF Treaty. Now, as a response to this, I don't know whether I'm right or wrong, we have a European army of nine member states that are trying to create a European army. Now, we see that something is going on inside the alliance. So it looks like the attraction force is among these issues. And my question would be, Madam Deputy Secretary General, what would be the attraction force to pull us from this feedback loop that is going on for quite a while, what exactly would be that something that will bring us together not to have so many differences of opinion, as you call it, or disagreement, because the Alliance is facing huge challenges right now. Thank you very much. The United Kingdom, Richard Benyon. Uh, thank you. Uh, the deterrent uh, effect of NATO is all about uh, its capability uh, to deter uh, a, an aggressor. Uh, and uh, while it's welcome that uh, many countries have increased their, uh, their spending on defense, uh, it, some of them are from a very low base. And it's, I hope you agree, it's really crucial that we stick to the Wales commitment of 2% and that we encourage all countries 
to achieve that. But in doing so, it's not how much money we spend, it's, not, it's how we spend it. And you said, spoke very eloquently about uh, a very good example of interoperability. Uh, but would you agree that there are problems of interoperability where people are purchasing defense equipment that uh, bears no relation to how others in the alliance do? And for example, uh, when one member of the alliance buys such items as air defense systems from Russia, does this not cause real problems in terms of that kind of interoperability that we so desire if we're to be an effective uh, alliance? The um, question about the high north, um, I will just say again, and it was very good this year that we had Trident Juncture uh, in Norway because it was a, a real wake-up call, I think, to uh, many of the countries across the alliance uh, for uh, understanding the real challenges of operating in, in cold weather and uh, everything from ensuring that they had winter tires on their vehicles to ensuring that they had uh, proper winter boots and proper winter clothing. Uh, for many of the allies, it was a very, very important step, uh, step forward. We need to do more of that. There's no question about it. And for that reason, I really emphasized in my remarks the need not only to do more training and exercising in the region, but to acquire uh, the equipment, the capabilities, uh, indeed, even the warm weather clothing that, that is needed. So allies will have to pay attention to that. Um, I am going to have to take your question, sir, on the annual report on the security situation in the Arctic, uh, whether the report is forthcoming. I know that we have regular now, um, our Joint Intelligence Division is regularly doing uh, re reports on this, but this particular report I am not aware of. Uh, of uh, its provenance, so I'm gonna have to check into it and I'll, I'll have to get back to you with an answer to that. Uh, the question from our, uh, our colleague from, uh, from uh, Skopje, um, you know, there are, again, differences of opinion among the uh, allies, but I will just re repeat again how important it is that we think about these as being uh, disagreements among a single family. And even though families can have pretty fierce fights from time to time, the family is not pulled asunder. It is not pulled apart uh, by, by fights. It, uh, it basically remains the family no matter what. And in that regard, I want to stress that from my perspective, all these discussions about autonomy, strategic autonomy, European army, European um, military forces, for NATO, this can work, but it can work as long as such forces contribute to burden sharing inside NATO. And for, for that to work, three important conditions must be fulfilled. First of all, if forces are to be developed in the EU context or um, as some of these discussions have been a, a kind of separate European context with just a more informal uh, conglomeration of countries involved, such forces must be also made available for, uh, for NATO missions and operations. They must be uh, resources that NATO also can draw on. Second important condition is that we, we can't have two competing and battling requirements processes. Each, uh, you know, the European countries and uh, EU itself, NATO, we, we have uh, procedures in train to develop the requirements to acquire capabilities. Those requirements cannot be clashing so that uh, EU and many EU nations are also NATO nations. They cannot be pulled in two directions by competing requirements. So that's the second important condition. They must be complementary. That requires very, very good, I think, transparency and communication between the EU and NATO on the important requirements issue. And by the way, to our, our uh, European Parliament colleague, that's another important area, I think, to continue to develop uh, good transparency and communication in the requirements arena. Some of that is quite technical, so we really have to be speaking the same language also on requirements. And the third important uh, matter is that the non-EU NATO allies 
uh, must also be involved in the process and there must be transparency for them. Uh, they must be able to, uh, to participate in the process. So as long as those three conditions are fulfilled, I think that we shouldn't be afraid of Europe developing its own capabilities, but uh, we have to be sure that we keep a sharp eye on those conditions and those conditions being, being fulfilled. Um, let's see, the question from the UK. Um, with regard to the purchase of air defense capabilities from, from Russia, uh, this concern has come up with the so-called S-400 purchase that Turkey uh, has in train. And uh, Sekjan and I and others in the NATO leadership, we've always been clear that it's up to nations to make their own decisions about what weapon systems uh, they are going to buy in order to fulfill requirements. But from the NATO perspective, it is really important that those systems be interoperable. And uh, this system is simply not interoperable with, uh, with uh, NATO systems, and it's difficult to see how it can be made interoperable. I, for one, was very, very glad when in January of this year, Turkey also with uh, France and Italy signed an agreement to develop together and, uh, and uh, construct and deploy the so-called SAM-T system which is uh, an air defense system that has uh, been long in development and, and uh, deployment. Uh, this will be a next, uh, next phase in the development of this system. We welcome that very much, working and cooperating among allies to develop weapon systems. Uh, that's good for everybody, but it's that, it's that interoperability point that is, is the key one for, uh, for the NATO uh, alliance. And now the last three in one group. Canada, Georgia, Netherlands. Canada, Cheryl Galliant, your floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and to the Secretary General. During the course of our conference, we learned more about hyper warfare and that a 21st century war will be a war fought with autonomous systems. Is NATO considering a new NATO strategic concept to lay out a vision for the role of artificial intelligence in the alliance and to address the challenges of future war? Georgi Kandelaki, Georgia. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Sec Deputy Secretary General, on October 29th of this year, Mr. Kosachev, uh, who is uh, one of the top foreign policy decision makers in Russia and chairs Foreign Affairs Committee of the Federation Council, said that if one of the, stated that if one of the two candidates in Georgia's forthcoming runoff of the presidential election wins, there will be, quote, unpleasant consequences for internal political processes in Georgia. In Georgia, too, there have been similar voices saying that if one of the candidates wins, opposition candidate in this case, they may be a civil war. How would you comment to such voices who challenge the ability of citizens to alternate holders of democratic offices uh, if they decide so? Thank you. Netherlands, Franklin Van Kappen. Thank you, Chair. First of all, uh, Deputy Secretary General, I would like to compliment you on the clear and concise way you answer, answer all our questions. Uh, my question concerns the nuclear issue. If you read the Gerasimov Doctrine and all the security publications that are freely available from Russia, there is this disturbing message that they consider the use of tactical nuclear weapons as de-escalatory in certain scenarios. Now, this can be part of a very complex game of political messaging. My answer to you is, um, did we send a message in return? And what was that message? And if you don't want to answer that question in a clear and concise way, could you reflect on this issue? Thank you. Uh, again, very... Uh, very good questions. Uh, many of them uh, would be worth uh, an entire seminar. The notion of uh, uh, hyper-warfare, where technology is taking us in terms of artificial intelligence, 
It's interesting, we just concluded the NATO industry forum last week in Berlin, and uh, it was entirely swept up in discussing this set of, of issues. We also have, of course, our command, the ACT command uh, in Norfolk that focuses day in, day out on innovation and uh, the future of warfare, what we need to uh, be thinking about in this regard. So. The answer uh, to your question is yes, we are thinking very hard about uh, new technology, where it is taking us, uh, where uh, it is taking the future of warfare, first and foremost because we need to be mindful of what threats we are going to be facing in future, but second, in order to ensure that uh, NATO also uh, is uh, on top of the new technologies and understanding what uh, what uh, those new technologies, what kinds of capabilities those will uh, those will bring, and I want to stress that NATO, as a defensive alliance, is always going to be looking at new technologies very much uh, with how they uh, continue to support and uh, develop our role as a defensive alliance. We are not going to be looking, obviously. Uh, for new offensive capabilities that uh, that would contradict that basic fact, principle, and tenet of the alliance that we are a defensive alliance. I think it's very important that as the entire alliance, we think about these new technologies across the board. Uh, we need to be thinking about uh, the normative superstructure that will uh, form around them. How are we going to think about uh, the utilization of autonomous weapon systems going forward? My own country, the United States of America, has long embraced a, a principle that is that decision making uh, with regard to autonomous platforms, autonomous weapon systems, must uh, continue to contain a man, or as I like to say, a man or woman in the loop that it is, is, it is not the case that uh, somehow you know, robot systems should be allowed to operate without continuing involvement of human decision makers. Now, where is, where is that going to go in future? I think we all need to reflect on these kinds of normative principles and think about the normative superstructure that will, uh, that will surround such systems going forward. So that's one important point. Another important point is to, uh, again, consider uh, what the relationship will be uh, between the kinds of threats that are confronting us in this arena and uh, where, they, where they emanate from. Indeed, the Russian Federation is putting a great deal of emphasis uh, in this area, and, uh, but other uh, adversaries, potential adversaries of the alliance, you know, it's the um, work on artificial intelligence and autonomous systems is widespread. Uh, so this is something we've also been very aware that you can confront in a kind of low-tech manner as well. One of the major projects we've had going on at NATO is to look at the way non-state actors, terrorists, uh, extremists are taking off the shelf technologies like um, drones that they can buy you know, off the shelf and uh, using them, modifying them slightly both for their own surveillance purposes but also for the delivery of, uh, of weapons, small and sometimes larger weapons. So all of these issues we have to take uh, into account. It's not only uh, the, the large threats that may emanate from peer competitors, but also these capabilities in the hands of non-state actors and what, what that is going to bring, um, bring to us in, in the threat environment. So this is a very complica complicated subject, but I did want to underscore that, uh, that NATO is focused on it. We don't have all the answers by any means, but we are focused on it and will continue. Uh, to focus on it going forward. That was the key message coming out of the NATO Industry Forum last week in, in Berlin. Um, well, Mr. Kozachov can have his say, um, but from a NATO perspective, and I think from uh, the perspective of all 29 democracies that make up the NATO alliance, it is simply untenable for outsiders to meddle in democratic processes and particularly in election processes. So that's my basic message here. I, Mr. Kozachov can have his say, but that's the wrong. 
there cannot be that kind of interference from the outside in election processes. We are 29 democracies. Our partners are in the democratic space as well. We need to be underscoring that message constantly. And it's something the Secretary General says all the time. So I hope uh, that Georgia feels supported in that regard. Uh, the Netherlands question, um, yes, uh, the question was with regard to tactical nuclear weapons and uh, this notion that somehow uh, in Russian doctrine they are, uh, they are portrayed in some settings as having a de-escalatory role. The core message from, uh, from NATO, and I think from, again, from all of our capitals, with regard to the use of nuclear weapons, we continue to emphasize that any use of a, weapons, a weapon of mass destruction is, is morally reprehensible and is not in any way justified by uh, battlefield uses or battlefield requirements, tactical requirements. So we, uh, again, it's more on the, on the normative plane. We need to continue to be consistent in conveying uh, the message that nuclear weapons use, any nuclear weapons use, it doesn't matter, a tactical nuclear weapon, a strategic warhead, it doesn't matter, but any nuclear weapons uh, use uh, is uh, reprehensible because as uh, Ronald Reagan himself used to like to say, my uh, famous well-known president, uh, a, nuclear a nuclear war uh, can never be won and should never be fought. So that's the top line message that we need to continue to stress when these kinds of um, discussions come out in, in Russian military literature, for example, or in other military literature as well that any use of weapons of a weapon of mass destruction is reprehensible and where nuclear weapons are concerned, a nuclear war can never be won and should never be fought. So thank you very much for your attention today. I've enjoyed talking to you as always. Uh, I'm very glad to have this opportunity today and we'll look forward to the next opportunity, believe me. It's always very good for me as well. Thank you. That concludes our questions, and Deputy Secretary General Rose, we always are happy to have you here, and it's very important part of our sessions, always, to have Secretary General or you answering the questions. This is what parliaments are about, to have direct communication and possibility to ask questions and get very detailed answers you did today. So now I, would, I will now suspend the sitting for a coffee break. Uh, we will resume at 12 for the address by His Excellency Talat Jeferi, President of the Assembly of the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. So have a good coffee break.